Okay, so I'm back from Vegas. My space is all cleaned up, so it's time to show you my video editing workflow. I actually don't wear these. These are gaming glasses. They eliminate the blue light. They make everything orange. So sometimes I wear them during the evening just to make sure that I can go to bed right after doing an intense edit and never wear these when doing anything color related. So many of you have requested to see my editing workflow in Premiere and I have four main tips for you today. Organizing, storyboarding, cutting and color grading. So let's begin right after this. So it was kind of a love at first sight, you know? There's really nothing like this exterior. I love the metallic color, the tinted glass panel, the RGB fans at the front. It's basically a see-through case and who doesn't love that? Your graphics card can go vertical, the top is radiator friendly, and the right side is so unique when exposed thanks to these cable covers. So you can show off everything you've got with the H500P by Cooler Master. Check it out in the description below. All right, guys, so today we'll be talking about something that's natural to me, but I understand that many people's editing workflows are super different. So bear with me in terms of uh, me outlining my steps, exactly how I would start a new project from start to finish. So I have a main SSD onto which I place all my current live projects, and then that gets moved into an archive. But right now I have a different folder for this particular project. So my editing workflow, and then into that, I have a footage folder into which I import all my GH5 Footage, and I would label them accordingly. If let's say I'm recording with multiple cameras, those files will be placed into its own folder so that I can differentiate between the footage. And obviously one major advantage of having everything sort of compact into one nice folder is that if you were to archive that thing, it can be easily just copy pasted into your, you know, NAS or whatever storage solution you use to back up your footage and your files. And that way, if you want to re-access those B-roll shots or project files or final render video files, files, it will be all contained in one folder instead of what Eber does having the three different folders for your footage, for your project files, and then for your final rendered videos. I think that's a bit of a mistaken way to kind of organize your files and can easily get lost and confusing if you're trying to find something more specific. And so starting with Premiere Pro, every single time I create a new project, and this is to eliminate any potential issues that Adobe might throw at me. And the naming scheme follows in the same footsteps of the actual folder into which this project is in. And I ended with PR indicating this is a Premiere Pro file in case I need to search for other projects let's say in the past. And it also allows for that visual distinction between uh, a, a different Adobe project. So if it's an After Effects file, I would call it AE. If it's an audition file, I would call it AU. Just a easier distinction when I'm viewing things inside the folder as list. In just settings, this is something quite interesting. So there are multiple options you can work with in your footage. So I actually create proxies, but multiple people transcode their footage of taking something that your camera has captured and transcoding it into an easier to edit Kodak. I do not transcode because the amount of space the transcoded files require is four X versus the original files. So that means if I shoot, let's say 100 gigabytes of B-roll, that transcoded footage would be to 400 gigabytes. And they're just way too much uh, in terms of archiving. So I create proxies for better and smoother editing instead. And so I choose 720p Cineform proxies, which are super small. They're really easy and smooth to work with. And um, yeah, and they're actually super easy and fast to actually render out. And they actually have a separate SSD for proxies specifically. That way when Premiere is trying to access files, we're not bottlenecking any of that bandwidth. So inside the new project, I create a new footage a folder into which I place all my files. And I don't use the project media browser inside Premiere. I just simply import them from a folder inside my window browser. And that way it actually allows me to see what files I've recorded. And I go through them and I delete the things that I know I will not be using. So let's say I have multiple takes of one shot uh, that I know I won't be using. I simply delete that from the folder and then I import Import everything into Premiere. And so that opens up the Adobe Media Encoder, which will render out those proxies that uh, I've set up to do as an ingest settings. And so this allows me to do this automatically uh, so that anytime I import any new files into my project, those proxies will be rendered automatically. And I don't have to worry about uh, having to select it and render the proxy for particular files. Everything is being rendered in proxies as soon as they are imported. And while this is happening, I don't touch Premiere because 
because sometimes it crashes and they would not recognize my rendered proxies. I would have to re redo the entire procedure again. So it's just a little bit of waiting time, but the actual smoothness that you get after uh, you know editing with proxies is excellent. Now here's a tip, dropping any of your files into this little thing creates a new sequence based on that footage uh, specifications. So I'm using 4K, 24P, and it automatically creates that thing. And I just rename the actual sequence and I reposition it inside, outside of the footage folder so that I can access it easily. And you can see it's main 4K at 24P, uh, just a little distinction that I know if I have to create something at 60p or 1080p timelines, those will be uh, labeled accordingly. And for videos where I am on camera, that will be its own folder called on cam. And that way it will have the actual video file and the audio file because I'm recording that externally. The clap always helps to synchronize audio with video. And uh, I used to do this manually, like align the audio file to the video and link the audio from the video file and then do this whole process. But now you can just select all your files and click synchronize and boom, all you have to do is clean up the handles in the beginning and the end and you're good to go. So now the organization aspect is covered, making sure that your proxies are being rendered, making sure your footage is organized inside the folder on your computer and inside Premiere. And so now let's talk about the second most important thing about video editing in my workflow is storyboarding. This is by far my favorite feature about Premiere and any other uh, video editors that have tried Final Cut and Resolve don't have this built in. So storyboarding allows you to organize your footage in the order that it'll be actually displayed in your timeline. And this way you don't have to find the footage and drag it into the timeline and then drag another one that you think will follow up well. You can do that all inside a very organized folder. You can even increase the size of the thumbnail and do your in and out point inside the projects folder before it gets inserted into the timeline. So you basically complete your entire edit or almost entirely um, without it being inside timeline. And it helps to save me so much time. And that way when it's actually inserted into the timeline, all I have to do is just like refine those edges and make sure that my handles and transitions are all good. And just for reference, Final Cut does not let you organize and sort manually footage just like you would in Premiere. And that means that despite its rendering performance is much faster, actually editing procedure, uh, it's not as good as Premiere. And that is of course for me personally. Now many people get confused as to how the proxies actually are displayed in your timeline and when they are being used by Premiere. So by default, the proxy toggle is not inside the window. So you have to click on the plus and you have to drag and drop basically customize your little uh, menu here underneath the preview window. And that way you can enable and disable toggle proxies at your wish. So if you want to see the full resolution file, you can, but if you want to be editing smoothly, enable proxies. And then when that's in blue, that means that uh, proxies are being used to preview your files. And that means that you can edit smoothly. It's very slow to edit in original 4K files. And if you have the proxies, you can fly through that edit. A few misconceptions, even if the toggle proxies is enabled and when you're exporting the file, it will still use your original file. Premiere is not dumb. It will not uh, you just start using your proxies to render out your final thing. And um, just, yeah, make sure that your toggle proxies icon is inserted into your playback uh, controls so you can see when the proxies are being used and when they're not used. Another huge advantage with working with proxies if they're on and you reopen a project, all the thumbnail previews for your footage will load instantaneously. So you can resume working and finding your files and everything like that just instantaneously as soon as the project is open. If the proxies are disabled, all the footage thumbnails will take forever to load with original files, at least for my GH5 footage that is 8-bit at 4K, either 24P or 30P. And so that takes a while for it to load and may take a while for you to resume the edit even if the project is fully open. And so now with storyboarding out of the way, you've compiled all your footage in order that you will see it in the timeline. Let's talk about cutting and color grading. Ah, damn, I got yoga in 20 minutes. It's better to edit in chunks anyway, so I'll be back shortly. And I'm back, yoga was great. Gotta cut my body some slack, I sit so much. Speaking of cutting, let's talk about my cutting tips. So first of all, if you're not using the ripple trim tool, you're wasting your time. Instead of you know cutting a certain portion and then cutting at the next portion that you don't need and deleting that file and then moving everything over, 
you just simply use ripple trim and then move uh, your file to a point where you want to continue on from next without having to do that whole thing manually. I always insert audio fade between clips and I set it by default to do like 10 frames and you can change the duration of that easily just so that we don't have any hard cuts in audio and just to helps to smooth out any variation in volume. For extra dynamics between clips, I like to extend the previous clip by five frames, letting the audio from the next clip to already start to play before the video resumes. And this creates this proper visual breakdown between my talking points without slowing down the overall pacing. I also like to change up the zoom just to emphasize the next talking point or to bring your attention to my emotion. Now you see this blue icon, it tells you if the footage or the audio are used in your timeline and clicking it shows you where it's already been used. And I look at this icon all the time to see if I have any B-roll unused and I wanna populate it in certain sections of my timeline so that I don't waste footage. For visual groupings of your scene, get into a habit of color coordinating your clips inside your timeline. This can be easily assigned to a keyboard shortcut. So for example, my intro is one color, my A roll or my on camera portion is another and my B roll is another. And this way, if you accidentally move one of the clips outside of where it's supposed to be, it might potentially signal your attention to that area and potentially highlight that error so you can fix it. Now, while cutting, you want to avoid using the crossfade transition especially if you're doing things on camera, it does not look, make sure that you're doing a hard cut when you're talking to the camera or actually just get into a habit of using hard cuts more often so that your composition and your pacing aligns better to those hard cuts. While cutting, avoid too much breathing room. See, that was way too long of a pause between that cut. So make sure that if you are talking and there is a pause to continue the cut uh, kind of appropriately so that the spacing is natural and you don't have those very long pauses that makes everyone very uncomfortable to watch. And once the on-camera edit is finished, I insert my B-roll that's already been storyboarded previously so that all the files are in order. All I have to do is insert them into the timeline and clean up between the cuts. And so a casual five to 10 minute video would take me about one to two hours to complete in the timeline. That's cutting everything, making sure everything is flowing well. And that is because I storyboard in advance and just simply insert everything into the timeline and clean up those handles so that things are properly aligned and the pacing is good. So now we're going to talk about color grading. So the number one tip I can give you regarding color is to use adjustment layers. So instead of color grading individual clips, anything you apply to the adjustment layer is already automatically applied to anything that's below it. So you can easily do a blanket grade throughout your entire video or like certain portions of the scenes that you know are familiar. For example, for me, I shoot in the studio with the same light, all, all the same settings. So my white balance doesn't really change. And so that means that I can apply the exact same grade across pretty much my entire B-roll shot and then be pretty happy with it. So I use Lumetri looks, it's built into Premiere, it's super powerful and I use my white walls as the benchmarks for the, to get that perfect white and I use the RGB parade on the left side to adjust my white balance between uh, the tint of the like temperature and then the tint as well to make sure that I'm not too green or too purple and then uh, making sure that my uh, graph, the RGB parade aligns accordingly where those peaks happen. Now in terms of exposure adjustment, I normally just crush my shadows and my blacks and bring up the contrast a little bit so that we have a little bit of pop in the scene because I shoot in a slightly flatter profile with my GH5. And to make sure my exposure is correct, I refer to the Luma waveform because my monitor is color accurate and it's calibrated but sometimes you need to know when you are clipping the highlights and when you're crushing your blacks too much and the Luma waveform shows you exactly that. And once I create that blanket grade using adjustment layers, I would normally go in and make sure that my clips match up and exposure and color and do little tweaks here and there if needed. For example, in these white scenes, one is a bit darker than the other and making sure that they match creates a seamless cut instead of you noticing that one was not properly exposed out of camera. And some of you may be wondering how I decide on my grade. Normally, I would just add a little bit of teal or blues into the shadows and a little bit oranges into the midtones to warm up that scene and don't touch 
to highlights at all because they're perfectly white already. And sometimes I would send in some screenshots to some people and wondering what they think about certain grades. And that way you get a little bit of an idea on like what people like, uh, not just what you're looking at, but uh, some people may give you suggestions on like make the scene a bit warmer. It's too, you know, too cool or something like that. That happens in my workflow quite often. The most important thing is the skin tone. And so that could be your reference point. It is why I add a little thing on the creative side because it like makes uh, my skin a little bit more pink than it is out of camera. It's like too yellow out of camera, which is not which is not what I look like anyway, but uh, making sure that your skin tone is fine uh, in the grade is kind of like your reference point. And then from then you can add little things here and there to spice it up if you want to go for a particular look. And so the final thing is obviously to watch your entire creation. Uh, I normally do that render it out, send it over for a little approval within our team so that if there are any mistakes, they're big, being picked up by other people. And so that gives us a little bit of leeway from me finishing a project and then from us actually publishing it on YouTube. And for the export settings, I use the YouTube 4K preset because it's quite standard. Quality is awesome, but I do bump up by the bit rate to 60 minimum and maximum to 90. And I rename the file following resolution the name of the project and revision number. So that if I have to re-render things in different resolutions or different revisions, I know exactly when things have been rendered. And it's not just like a copy of your final project, copy, copy, copy of your final project. It is all by revisions. All right, so that's how I edit. I hope this uh, workflow video has been helpful for you to maybe learn something new. And if you have any tips on how I can improve my overall efficiency in the timeline or whatever, let me know in the comments. And in terms of archiving, I just, uh, you know, once the project is finished and it's uploaded, I just cut that entire folder into my NAS for archiving so that I can access anything from that entire project later on. So I save absolutely everything um, for future use potentially, but I don't know, like 95% of the time, I never open any folder once it's been archived. So maybe I should rethink my archiving strategy. But yeah, that's it. I'm Dimitri. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you.